Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I'm Maria Thompson Corley. If that quote from Philippians resonated with you, stay tuned. I'd love to introduce you to intriguing, creative people whose light is making our world a lovelier place. Welcome to Finding Beauty. 1883, third month, 16. Some moments set my heart on fire, and that's when language seems the smallest. Yet precisely these bursts of feeling make me long to write. I sit now in a high-walled courtyard amid the green smells and slanted light of early spring with that familiar burning in my heart. I'll need to destroy these pages before returning home, but no matter. For the first time since mother's death, words come to me. I've lost more than I've gained since mother died last year when I was but 22, yet I wish to tell of some good things. This small courtyard, with its carved stone bench, for instance, which fast becomes my refuge. For with spring upon us, there is such a wellness in the out-of-doors. Crocuses peer from the melting snow. Budding trees sweeten the air with their exhalations. If I were at home, I'd have turned the soil in our kitchen garden today and planted radish and lettuce seeds besides. For supper, I'd have made a soup from the hardy kale and onions that survived the winter. But I'm not at home. I'm at the Philadelphia Haven for women and infants. I've fled the building to this sheltered patch of ground to escape the struggles of my roommate Nancy, who till this morning slept in a bed beside mine and now moans and yells from the birthing table. Her sounds are as guttural and plaintive as those of a dog with its leg clamped in a trap. Even the stoutest girls among us have gone pale from hearing, for each will have her turn soon, and then will return from disgrace only by giving up her offspring and denying its existence ever after, as I will do. That was the opening of the novel Lily de Young, read by the author, today's guest, Janet Benton. She began writing early and has worked hard to give books a central place in her life. She grew up in a small town in Connecticut and skipped eighth grade to travel the world with her working artist mother. She holds an MFA in English and fiction writing from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a BA in Religious Studies from Oberlin College. After working at magazines, newspapers, and publishers, running an editorial business, and teaching writing at four universities and privately, she began the Word Studio, www.thewordstudio.us, to focus on working with writers. Janet Benton, thank you so much for joining me. I was really struck by the first sentence of your bio, and it makes it seem like there was a bit of a struggle to give books a central place in your life. Is that the case? Uh, Well, considering that publishing is one of the lower-paid industries you can enter, uh, yes, (laughs) it's a sort of a monastic choice almost to uh, choose to give books a central place in your life. In what capacity were you working in publishing? Uh, Well, when I was in uh, my last year of college, my first semester, I, I guess the year before I had thought, well, I'd better get some professional experience since I'm graduating in a year, and I signed up for a program that would allow me to do a full semester internship at a magazine or newspaper. And I had a few choices, and having grown up with the very first of the issues of Ms. Magazine and and years beyond, I chose Ms. Mm -hmm. So I did a semester-long internship at Ms. Magazine, unpaid. Back then you could do that two people. Uh, (laughs) Nowadays, you know, there have been all these protests and mostly internships are paid, but back then um, we were actually paying for a semester of college while I was working for free for me as for the semester. Um, But anyway, uh, it was somewhat of an interesting experience, um, although I was mostly underutilized, but I'm certainly grateful that I had the experience. And then when I finished that up, 
I was still going to be in New York for another month, so I did a one-month internship at an arts news. Actually, I think I had started working there a few months before. So I worked for several months during that time and in January for a newspaper called the New York Beat, which was a Soho-based arts newspaper. And that was where I first began editing. Um, I was writing, and I was also editing other people's writings for the newspaper. And then I went back to college and finished up my degree. And then when I graduated, I moved to New York after a couple months somewhere else and um, started looking for newspaper and magazine jobs. And I ended up, my first job was a news editor at the Brooklyn Heights Press, which was an old newspaper in the Brooklyn Heights neighborhood. And then I got a job as an editorial assistant at Working Woman Magazine and rose slightly in the ranks there before leaving. So, yeah, I guess it was then that I realized that um, putting words at the center of your life was a choice that people usually made when they had trust funds or great <laughs> of support from their parents. I literally remember, you know, we had these little cubicles at Working Woman, um, and I literally remember one of my colleagues making plans to go to the opera box that her family had with friends each weekend or so, and she would, in the winter, strolled around in a full-length fur coat. Um, <laughs> there were a few of us who were actually making our own way, but most of the time when you would go visit your, you know, office mate who was also an editorial assistant earning $12,000 a year, you'd find that she had a lovely apartment on the Upper East Side that her parents were obviously paying for, or in some <laughs> cases had bought. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, it kind of was a rude awakening, but it hasn't kept me out of the business. So you majored in fiction. Were you writing fiction all that time? Um, I made, Actually, in college, I was a religious studies major. Okay. Um, yeah. I did write fiction in college, and I took a few writing classes. And so, so your MFA in English. Yeah. Um, that was that was, that was after you writing. were working in New York. Is that is that right? Yes, that's right. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I, you know, I, for some I, reason, I thought that you did your MFA and then you got this um, interest in, in religious studies. But, okay, so religious studies was kind of your first love. How did you decide to do that? Um, my first love really was writing, and I started telling stories even before I could write mm -hmm. um, and composing poems in my mind. But when I went to college, I expected to be an English major, and I went to a couple of English classes. And while I certainly loved reading the books, I just didn't find the process of literary analysis to be um, connected enough to what I loved about reading. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now I would find it really interesting to go and look at the narrative techniques in certain books or talk about point of view or, uh, you know, I could talk about craft until the cows come home now and I love craft. But mm -hmm. at that time, I really was like a sink into the bathtub kind of a reader and I didn't mm -hmm. have any training from my schooling to know how to do anything else. So I was really interested in issues of meaning, you know, what gives life meaning. So uh, I think it was just kind of almost a coincidence that I walked into my first religious studies class, my second semester of my freshman year, and fell in love with it. It was just, you know, we were talking about these big issues of human life. Um, how do we make sense of life? What is our place here on Earth? Hmm. And from then on, you know, I was hooked. Yeah. I'm taking my questions out of my originally planned order, but I think this is a little bit of a segue because um, being interested in, in the meaning of life, I would think that the year that you traveled around, um, said skipped eighth grade to travel the world with your mother, I would think that being exposed to all these different cultures, I don't know, I would think that would make me think more deeply than your average cloistered eighth grader. Is that the case? You are or so how is right. You're so right um, that when I went into that first religious studies class, it was the first classroom I had been in where anyone acknowledged that there were meaning systems beyond the ones that we were surrounded by. Yes, thank you for making that point. Um, I felt like in religious studies, I could be a part of looking at, you know, a variety of human societies, a variety of ways of thinking and living and believing. And that's completely what had happened for me when my mother and I traveled around the world in eighth grade. 
you know, every assumption I had had about what was so-called normal or just fundamental to my society was broken apart. I mean, stand in a desert in front of a thousands-year-old stone sculpt, huge sculpture to the Sun King, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and <laughs> surrounded by people dressed differently and speaking different languages that you've never even heard of before, you're bound to realize, gee, what I thought was the way life is really isn't. Um, yeah, or at least not everywhere, <laughs> you know. Um, so how did that come about? I mean, your mother must have been um, quite an unusual woman. Um, yeah, to, to, to my that. mother is a <laughs> fascinating um, and brave person and uh, with a lot of fire. She became a very active feminist when I was about six. So by the mid-70s, she and she was an artist, and she'd been doing a lot of performing with masks. She made these um, welded metal masks, and she told stories originally, uh, beginning with stories from the various books of the Bible, telling them from the woman's point of view. So instead of hearing about Abraham and Isaac, we hear about Sarah. How does Sarah feel about her son almost being sacrificed, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, how did Hagar feel about Abraham coming in and basically probably raping her so yeah. that he could have an heir? So these were very powerful stories, and this was a time when a lot of churches in particular, national groups of churches such as the Methodist, the United Church of Christ, um, they were really radicalizing. And so they were bringing my mother in to give performances of these powerful tales that she would tell from behind these masks to sometimes thousands of, of women. Uh, so she had a good ally um, at one of the national church groups um, who said, you should travel and learn about the mask traditions around the world. Or I think what happened is my mother said she wanted to do that, actually. And then this woman said, I will help you. So... Mm -hmm. My mother is Jewish. My family is Jewish, but um, these church groups gave her, I think it was about $20,000 all told. And at the time, that was in 1976, that was enough for us to travel cheaply around mm -hmm. the world for a, a year. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so she did set up studios in a lot of countries, went to junkyards in different countries and grabbed the scrap metal to make her masks out of and sculptures. Um we stayed for varying lengths of time. We went to 14 countries. Can you list them? And I'm just very curious. Like, can you remember all 14? <laughs> yeah, curious. yeah. I don't have them in the right order. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> we started out in Japan, and then we went to South Korea. Let's see. Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Bali, India, Greece, Nepal, Israel, India, Egypt, Italy, Denmark, Yugoslavia, and London, or England. Wow. Well, oh, I, I, yeah, it might have been, maybe it was 15. Did I say Greece? No, I did say Greece. Yeah. So you did say Greece. I, I wasn't counting. I have to admit. <laughs> counting. The places we stayed the longest were uh, South Korea, Greece, and India. India, we stayed for three months. I mean, what an education, though. I mean, even though yeah, you weren't quite in, a, in a classroom. So what did you do with your days? Just kind of observe what she was doing or wrote down stories? or? We did a lot of traveling together. Um mm -hmm. And I would go with my mom sometimes when she was giving workshops. Um, part of the mission of her trip was to gather stories of women from around the world. Mm -hmm. So she would make these masks, um, mm -hmm. and she had some masks that she traveled with from place to place also, and do these workshops where women would tell stories from their own lives or from their cultural heritage, but they would flip them to tell them from the woman's point of view. Hmm. So she has all these tapes of these um, these workshops and it was quite amazing and that was really really influential for me as a writer um, mm -hmm. you know very much connected to my novel which is telling a story that we don't normally hear from the particular point of view that it's told by so I saw that there was a lot of power in telling stories and in changing the point of view Let's talk about Lily. Lily de Jong was chosen as one of Library Journal's top books of 2017 and also made the list of the top books chosen by NPR this year. Um, it's currently in the running for Goodreads' favorite historical novel, and um, I, am, I was really happy to see that because I just thought it was an excellent book, and I'm glad that enough people were willing to take that journey with her. Um, 
and Lily is a, a complex character and, you know, has a, a certain moral compass, but she ends up in situations where that's tested. And it is both impressive to me how well you conveyed her as a real person and also sort of depressing to me that in raising a child as a single mother and, you know, I divorced um, and have basically raised my two kids, I mean, pretty much by myself as far as the time element and, and doing things with them. So anyway, um, the story is definitely rooted in the era of the 19th century, but the, some of the attitudes that people had and I can see they still have and some of the struggles of being able to work and find childcare um, at the yeah. same time and afford it are universal, I think, still. So can you just explain to me the process of deciding to tell that particular story? Um, you know, I think... It's somewhat mysterious why stories come to us. Um, I know that some people will say, you know, it could be some glimpse they get through a doorway that makes them curious about a certain situation and it starts to grow in their mind. Um, in the case of my novel, Lily de Young, it came from a glimpse of the past that I got through a review um, in a magazine of a book called The History of the European Family. It's a three-volume series, and I learned in reading that review enough to interest me in the lives of so-called unwed mothers and their babies in the past. Um, one thing that I learned was that almost all of their babies would die when they were separated from their mothers due to prejudice. Hmm. So we're talking about millions of babies here over the course of European history. Um, hmm. And this is just in Europe. This is very common throughout the world still. Mm -hmm. um, babies no longer die usually because, unless they are killed on purpose, uh, because we have formula, um, or some places have formula, but without a mother's milk, babies had no, no way to survive. So... Hmm. I had a baby at my breast at the time, my own daughter, and it really stunned me and broke my heart to think of these tragedies. Um, and I started le learning more. I learned that these unwed mothers um, in Philadelphia, which is the area I live in, um, and in other cities in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, um, would be prime candidates for in-home wet nursing. Um, mm -hmm. Their milk was the right age for someone else's newborn, and this was the, the most valuable thing that they had to sell was their own milk. They would be barred from other jobs if their situation was known. Um, often they had left home in disgrace and couldn't go home. So for at least six months to a year, they had this very valuable milk that their bodies were producing. So they could move into a wealthy family's home or even a middle-class family's home and nurse someone else's newborn. And the price of that was giving up their own baby, usually. There were some homes where they were allowed to bring their babies in, but according to the research I've read, that was rare. In most cases, they would give the baby up to an almshouse, to an orphanage, or they might even leave the baby on the street uh, or give it to someone who would claim to find an actual family for it and not do so. Um, sometimes they were charged a fee for that. Um, and sometimes they would try to board it with a poorer wet nurse who was nursing multiple infants, which is what my character, Lily DeYoung, tries to do. When I learned these things, uh, I was nursing my daughter and in the dark and at night and this voice of this young woman just started to come to me. And you tell the story in the form of a diary. How did you make that decision? It just also came that way. It came as her first person voice in the moment telling me what she felt and thought and what was going on. Um, and I have always um, been very moved by the diary novels I have read. When I think back into my early reading, I think first-person narratives were always particularly powerful to me, um, such as Jane Eyre. And then, you know, I think the first diary novel that I read as an adult was, actually, now that I think of it, I mean, there was even, you know, Are You There, Goddess Me, Margaret by Judy Bell. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, um, which I loved when I was, you know, I don't know, 10, 11. Mm -hmm. Um, And then as I got older, the color purple Mm -hmm. just blew me away. And um, Mary Riley by Valerie Martin, another very powerful, beautiful diary novel. So there aren't very many successful diary novels. It's a hard form, but Mm -hmm. I wanted to do it. I, I feel like when it works, intensity of the closeness between the reader and the character is something that I wanted to to create. I suppose the downside is that, of course, that you can only ever see what that person sees. But, I mean, I think you, obviously, I, I think you pulled it off beautifully in, in this book. Um, okay, and she is a Quaker. And I, I was thinking that your religious studies came through in, in, in that aspect, but maybe that wasn't why you chose to, to make her a Quaker. Can you explain that? Well, I knew enough about the late 1800s when I first began um, to know that the likelihood of someone not being religious at that time was very, very low. Mm -hmm. Um, So I knew I needed to give her some religion, and I also wanted to give her, you know, a staff to hold, something to sustain her. Mm -hmm. So I, at some point, it became clear to me that the story was going to be set in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia, which is an amazing, fascinating neighborhood with a deep history that is still very evident to the eye. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that neighborhood had been founded by Quakers primarily. Um, There were Mennonites there early too. So I looked into both of those religions and I felt more comfortable with Quaker beliefs. I think as someone who was loosely raised in the Jewish tradition, um, we went to temple until I was about nine, at which point my parents divorced and we stopped going. But I think that there's a lot in common between the Society of Friends beliefs and Judaism. You know, this idea that an individual can have a direct relationship with the divine. There are many stories in the first books of the Bible, the Torah, Um, of these kinds of encounters occurring. Mm -hmm. And this idea that there is the light of God in everyone is very similar to a Jewish mystical idea called the Shekinah, which is the same thing, a little tiny piece of God, a little piece of a star, if you will, in everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And the commitment to social justice. And I liked that Quakers didn't, I mean, they studied the Bible, some people studied the Bible, but they weren't Um, bound by the Bible to the same degree. There was an emphasis on what you could find within yourself and know to be true, which is why they were early dissenters from the slave culture and why they were so often involved in the Underground Railroad and uh, Mm -hmm. didn't use uh, slave-created products like Mm -hmm. cotton and sugar. They emphasized very much trying to live without oppressing others. So this is certainly not to say that, um, you know, Quakers were perfect or are perfect. You know, they are human beings and um, have all the problems that other human beings have. But I felt like I could portray um, that group of people and an individual from that group more convincingly than I might have been able to if she was from some other religion. Um, Another piece was that Quakers educated females and males equally. I wanted her to be smart, and I wanted her to be able to write well. And, Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the act of writing really is what keeps her alive. Definitely. And and you you mentioned that you started reading and, and, you know, you started researching. And I know this book took many years to write. Um, And I know partially that was because you had a business that you were doing at the same time. And so do you have something else in mind to write? And would you do another historical novel? Um, or have you thought that far ahead? Um, yeah, I, I do have three novels in process. Um, one of them is contemporary, and that is the one that I'm working on now, probably because I need a little bit of a palate cleanser, <laughs> sorbet yes. between my historical novels. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, historical novels are, I mean, at least uh, for me, the, with my very thorough personality, it's quite an undertaking. 
so it's a pleasure to be at the very beginning stages of a contemporary novel. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know how long it's going to take me because I've only finished one novel before. Uh, I believe it will be quicker than, I mean, you know, than having to do that intensive research. I will be doing research for this novel, but not nearly as much. Well, I mean, if there's something that you can actually look around or that you have lived through, I suppose that that cuts down on the research a little bit. And speaking of Lily being educated, um, this part of her education seemed to happen mainly once she became a a wet nurse, and that was her interest in John Stuart Mill. Um, And so this attraction to philosophy, which I enjoyed a lot because I'm one of these analytical people, um, is that something that you've always felt as well? Absolutely, yeah. I I don't really know um, what the beginning of that was, but I think that there's a lot of room in a novel for philosophy, whether you are literally quoting a philosopher, as I do a little bit in this novel, or whether you're just exploring big philosophical issues. Um, you know, the novels that stay with me through the years are novels that take on big issues. and I I like that about novels. I agree. <laughs> Very much so. Okay, so um I was reading as I was reading some of the um things listed on your website that you had published or or that you have done, I noted that you've written a script for a documentary or two, I think. So, is that something that interests you writing a script for your novel perhaps? I have considered it and then I thought I would really rather put the time into my next novel. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason is that when you do a contract with a publisher, often they um, ask for, you know, the exclusive right to see your next novel, Mm -hmm. and that is the case for me. So there's a chance that that novel could be uh, put under contract and that I would get paid something up front that would enable me to write it, to finish writing it. Yeah. So just from a very practical point of view, which is pretty much the bottom line for most of us, if I were to be writing a screenplay instead, uh, it would be, yeah, you know, there'd be no chance of getting paid unless I hit the extraordinary jackpot and someone, you know, wanted to make a movie out of the novel. Um, and that's that, really that hard. Has, yeah, I mean, there <laughs> has been some movie interest, and if. <laughs> that came about, I would very much hope to be involved in the screenplay writing because I think you you can wreck a novel. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. But as far as just writing one on spec, so to speak, that hasn't been something that has, you know, captured my imagination at this point. I have to yeah. say, actually, that um, going around to events and book groups, uh, when people have read the novel and raise their hand and say, what happened to Clementina after the novel ends or what happened to Nancy or what happened to, yeah. um, you know, Charlotte and Lily or Johan? Did he ever find yeah. his way a little better? And um, that actually does interest me. And so, you know, if there's anyone out there who wants to do a TV series, I'd be happy to contribute. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I I wanted to ask you also, um, what keeps you inspired? I don't know how to not be inspired, really. Mm-hmm. Um, even when I'm miserable, I'm inspired by the idea that I can somehow write about the misery and get to the other side of it. I'm someone who just is surrounded by scraps of paper on which I have scrawled, you know, whatever the day's idea is for an essay or something that outrages me or uh, mm-hmm. something I just remembered that I think, you know, I should explore. And I weighed down by pounds and pounds of pieces of paper that tell me they need more attention from me. So I wish I was less inspired. Yeah, I mean, I I totally relate to that whole thing of, like, there are all these things that seem like they really would – feed you and then you have to do things that feed you literally (laughs) you know and it's getting to all these other things but I mean because you spend a lot of time um, you know the word studio is uh, a teaching studio in um, I mean do you want to explain the word studio a little bit sure Um, I started it after having had an editorial business for I think about 15 years in which I 
wrote and edited for lots of cultural institutions and nonprofits and individuals. And I decided in 2010 to focus entirely on working with writers and on writing, and that included those screenplays, uh, the the documentaries, which was mm-hmm. quite a wonderful thing to work on. So the Word Studio. Initially, I pictured it as a place where lots of other people would also be teaching under my umbrella, which I did realize, uh, that was a vision that I did realize for three or four years. But then when I wanted to finish my novel and get it out into the world, I needed to pull back from that. So um, I'm, I was doing less teaching, um, but all the way through I've been working privately with writers on their manuscripts, which is really quite an honor. Mm. Um, and now I'm coming back to teaching again, and I'm really, really enjoying it. Yeah, because I, I know as someone who teaches music, obviously in interacting with other people and their ideas, you, you do, I think, learn a lot just from even, like when you're talking about not being someone who is so interested in breaking things down, I mean, that's how I would approach music when I was younger in particular with just, okay, I, you know, I want experience that I don't necessarily want to analyze every chord you know, I just want to feel them instinctively and be moved by them and try to convey that, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then, you know, as you get um, into this phase of of maybe deciding or needing the income or whatever it is that causes you to start teaching, um, I know I've found that I've learned so much about my instrument and how to approach it from having to explain it to other people. And I would assume that looking at other people's manuscripts and having to figure out ways to improve them has really made... Uh, you more, I don't know, enabled you in, in your own writing? Is that is that a fair comment? If there was a word stronger than absolutely, I would use it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I completely agree with you. I have learned so much. I have learned almost everything I know about writing as a teacher. And I started teaching at the age of 24 uh, when I First was in graduate school at University of California, Davis, and I had the great fortune to be mentored by a wonderful composition teacher named Carolyn Brown, who now teaches at the University of San Francisco. And after that, I, I at the same program, I, I taught fiction. And even though I was in graduate school for four years total, um, I never was taught a thing, apart from one perhaps 10-minute lecture on point of view. All we Mm. did was workshop people's stories. No one ever talked about craft. Mm. And so it was by reading in order to teach and by reading years of my students' manuscripts um, and then becoming a private mentor that I have just sharpened and sharpened and sharpened my awareness and my skills to the point that I honestly kind of feel like I'm holding so much knowledge now that, uh, you know, I don't typically toot my own horn, but I feel like I just have vast amounts to share. And it seems like my, you know, the people who work with me feel that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes I wish I could do it on a larger canvas. Yeah, I'd like to write a book, actually, about the craft of writing, but there are so many books out there on the craft of writing. Um, I think mine would be, you know, obviously different, um, and one day I will do that. So just a couple more questions. And these are some that I ask everybody. And the first one is, what comes to mind when you hear the word beauty? I love that question. And I was surprised that I immediately had an answer when I read that you were going to ask me that question. Um, wow. Yeah, I recognize beauty in something because it gives me a feeling that raises me above my usual awareness and makes me see freshly. Mm. It doesn't have to be beautiful in the sense of pretty. Um, It's something that stops me in my tracks and makes me keep looking and creates a sense of wonder in me. I like that. Can you think of examples, or is it just you know it when you see it, and there's nothing that you know you would name specifically that comes to mind? Uh, it could be a painting. It could be a tree. It could be a bird. It could be a passage of writing. It could be someone's voice singing. Um, you know, I don't. It could be dance. Um, 
it's not necessarily art. It could be someone expressing something heartfelt. Just a wide range of things that elevate you. Yeah, yeah. something yeah. it could be something from the natural world, something from the human world. Mhm, mhm. And so, I mean, that means it's all, it's all around, which is a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't have to be in a and I'm not. Place. I suppose it says something about me that I would tend to see it in works of art um, rather than, say, in a math equation. But you know, that's only yeah. because I don't I don't understand them well enough to see the beauty in them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm with you there. (laughs) Okay, and the other question that I ask everybody is, can art change the world? I certainly hope so. (laughs) Um, I happen to be a little old-fashioned, perhaps. I'm not certain that it's old-fashioned, but um, it's not always in fashion uh, to say that I think that the role of art is to change the world. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Lincoln Abraham Lincoln called her the little lady who started a war because mm. some people said that her novel, as limited as it might seem to us today, showed the life of, a, of an enslaved man and made people think, huh, he's human. I think the role of art is to make us more compassionate, to open up areas of life that we may not have considered and to deepen us. And mm-hmm. There's lots of entertainment out there. There are lots of people writing um, things that don't accomplish that, and I wouldn't call that art. One of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you was because I felt that in Lily there's an opportunity for people to perhaps look a little bit more deeply in at some of their own prejudices and judgments. Obviously, uh, in her case, she is a very devoted mother, and I'm not saying that all people who have children are, are good mothers and that we should cut them all slack, but what I'm saying is that in looking at these challenges, even um, this idea of legislation for uh, making it more uh, conceivable for women who really need to work to be able to afford childcare if they're, they don't have a lot of money to begin with or don't have a lot of family they can rely on, um, this was something that was being talked about. I don't think it's being talked about so much anymore, but it's an ongoing thing because there are still children and they still have parents who maybe don't have a lot of means. So I think that in having a book like this that looks at what things were and how awful they were, um, we hopefully realize the need to continue to move forward in making it possible for people to raise healthy children and to still have um, some resources uh, to provide for them more than just food and shelter, or you know, you, do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I hope you're you, <laughs> a bit of a rant, but you, you <laughs> have to look sense. no further than the way that mothers and young children are left to struggle for ourselves uh, to convince yourself that we live in a profoundly patriarchal society. Mm-hmm. Uh, motherhood is the most undervalued work in our society, and the difficulties that women go through in order to raise the next generation are, to me, unforgivable. Mm. Um, You know, I don't – I understand um, that not everyone faces all of those difficulties because some people are surrounded by a large extended family. Um, Some people have ample financial means and don't face the same strains. But – the undervaluation of the work that mothers do um, affects every single one of us profoundly. Um, it affects the outcomes for children. It affects, um, you know, our standard of living. Um, it affects the quality of mothering, the quality of love that people are able to give. Mm-hmm. And really that I wanted this book to crack people's hearts open and mm-hmm. make them say, this work is the fundamental work of human society, and we must do a better job of supporting mothers and young children. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that was that was my last question. And so, um, in closing, if people want to connect with you, um, what's the best way to go about that? Uh, they are welcome to email me directly. Um, my email is Janet dot the word studio at gmail dot com. My business is called The Word Studio, and the website is www.thewordstudio.us. Uh, I also have an author page that they can contact me through and learn more about my novel and read reviews and, and see more interviews with me and so on, and that is um, www.janetbentonauthor.com. I'm happy to visit book groups in the region. Um, 
or anywhere by Skype. And I love hearing from readers. Okay. Well, I'm Maria Thompson Corley, and this has been Finding Beauty. The theme music for Finding Beauty is Symphony of Light, written and performed by Kiana Corley, with assistance on the cello from Allegra Banks. Rusty Banks was the producer. Right now, you're listening to Liszt's Petrarch Sonnet Number no. 104, performed by yours truly. You can hear the rest of it on my CD, Music from the Novel Letting Go, available on CreateSpace and Amazon. If you're interested, you can check me out at mariacorley.com or mariasworld.us. You can also find me on Twitter, at Maria Corley, or YouTube. My recordings are available through Albany or Amazon. My novel, Letting Go, is available on Smashwords, CreateSpace, Barnes & Noble, and Amazon. Or drop me a line on my site, and I'll send you a signed copy. I want to leave you with one more quote. Do your little bit of good where you are. It's the little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Desmond Tutu. Have a beautiful day. <laughs>